Hey, what's going on guys? I am Folygon, and in this video I'm going to be doing a collaboration with the wonderful I'm a Wonder. Whether she's using gouache, acrylic, or anything in between, Tina has some truly inspiring portraits on her channel where she shows off her painting process as well as her experience with a variety of different paints. And in this video, I am going to be translating one of her brand new portraits to 3D. Now, I know many of you are coming from Tina's video over here to check out my part of the process, but if you haven't checked out her part yet, I encourage you to watch that first so you can see the character develop in 2D before I do my part. There's a link down in the description to her video. Go give her some love and then come back here for part two. So I'm a Wonder has created a new artwork for me to translate to 3D. I have not looked at it yet. I have it right here about to be pulled up on my phone. I'll pull it up on the screen as well. I'm so excited to check this out. I've been wanting to do this, but I haven't peeked yet. So here we go. Let's check it out. <laughs> yes. Oh my gosh. This is so awesome. I love the Japanese feel to this. Uh, we got the Japanese kind of Sailor Moon-esque old school uh, school uniform. Old school school uniform. Uh, we got the little uh, Ka Hiragana over on the arm over there. Is that like a, oh, what are those called? Like the the knuckles thing, but it's like a cat ear thing almost. I, I think that's just a two finger ring. It's not for punching or hitting. She does look pretty punky though. Loving the spikes in the hair. Her hair is awesome altogether. The face is amazing. The sad face on the cheek. The Oh my gosh, yes. Loving the piercings. Loving the little choker with the heart. I'm definitely getting some really cool vibes from this. Loving the overall aesthetic is just really cool. The background here. Ah, oh my god, Tina. This is awesome. I love this and I cannot get... W <laughs> I can't even talk straight. I can't wait to get started on this. This is going to be so much fun. She also said that she included some sketches with this. So I'll, I'll put that up on the screen as well here. Ooh, very nice. So we got some preliminary... Uh, line work here. The profile view is always very helpful as a 3D artist. The more views you can get, the more helpful that is. Awesome. Oh my gosh. This is, <laughs> I know I keep, I just keep the saying the same thing over and over and over like, oh, that's so awesome. It's so cool. But it is, it really is awesome. I love doing this kind of thing and getting to see this for the first time here. You know, the more I look at this, the more I realize that there's actually even more cool stuff going on. I really like the way that this was terminated so that it doesn't necessarily just look like a floating torso. A lot of the time with busts, you'll get that look where it's just like kind of chopped off or something like that. But the uh, pose there with the arms actually helps to hide that cutoff, which is pretty cool. All right, that is enough talking about this amazing 2D piece. It's time for us to translate this to 3D. I know we're gonna have some new people here that have never heard of digital sculpting, so I wanted to give a quick demo for you guys so you can kind of get the idea. Think of this as a ball of digital clay, and I can kind of sculpt directly on top of this to kind of create, you know, whatever, <laughs> whatever shape you want, like a derpy smiley face. Uh, this is a very rudimentary and basic kind of idea and understanding. There's, you know, a lot of other kind of tools and stuff that you can do in here, but this is enough to kind of get you mentally in the space where we need to be. This software is called ZBrush Core Mini, by the way. It's completely free, and I have a completely free tutorial for you guys up in the top right-hand corner of the screen if you want to learn more about digital sculpting and how you can get started here. And with that quick demo out of the way, let's go ahead and get started on I'm a Wonders character. So now it's time to get in and start sculpting this Sukeban character. I'll be speeding this process up because the video would be well over 30 hours long if I didn't. I will be starting with a simple sphere and we'll be building the entire character from scratch. Think of it like having a ball of clay that you can push and pull around. And you'll see as we move forward that I will throw more pieces of digital clay on this, well, soon to be head. If I were comparing this to 2D, this part of the process is kind of like doing your line work for an illustration. It's the foundation for everything moving forward. I'll be talking about the entire process as we move forward. As part of my collab with I'm a Wonder, we have asked each other some questions that we thought would be fun to answer during our videos. The first one is an excellent question, and I'm not sure if it's something I've ever talked about on my channel in the past. The question is, what influenced you to become a 3D modeler? I didn't really get into making art until my early 20s, so I'm not the type of kid who popped out with a paintbrush in my hand, although I wish that I was. Uh, before being introduced to digital sculpting, I was obsessed with digital painting. 
I loved watching speed paints and time lapses on YouTube. I've always admired the work of Fang Zhu, the creator of FCD School of Design. I knew nothing about painting, drawing, or really even art in general, but I was always fascinated by his ability to create something so amazing from scratch and in such a short amount of time. It was like he had some type of superpower or that he had practiced a ton. Probably a little bit of both. I originally tried to pick up digital painting, but it never really stuck. I was a giant noob who didn't want to practice to achieve quality results, and it definitely showed. Working in 3D first piqued my interest while I was in college. I was really into animating and playing around with physics simulations, explosions, shattering objects, and all that good stuff. It wasn't until my final year of college that I discovered digital sculpting. Back then, there weren't many tutorials online or really any easily accessible guidance for learning 3D sculpting, kind of one of the reasons why I started this channel. So I had to learn the old-fashioned way and head down to the bookstore. I grabbed a couple of Scott Spencer's books on digital sculpting, read every single page, dog-eared every other, and the rest is, well, history. And I've been sculpting every single day ever since. But that's enough about me, let's talk more about this process. I put a little paint on the character at this stage, which helps with proportions. I normally keep this very rough at this point. This is how I check my form development early on. It can be really tough, even if you have your forms in a good place, to know if they are correct, and that is because color has weight. More so value, your lights and your darks have weight, and unless you check how everything is coming together as a whole, you are going to end up wasting some time. So I try to check this stuff as early as I can. We'll talk more about color here shortly, but for now, let's continue refining our sculpt. While sculpting, you will often see me place in super hard lines that define plane changes. This is something I don't think a lot of people understand about sculpture. You can't easily start off creating nice, smooth, and organic shapes that match your reference without first understanding and creating the structure. Now, I'm not talking about anatomy here. Anatomy is a tool like anything else, and it can be helpful to understand why something is shaped a particular way. What I'm talking about is essentially a combination of many fundamentals, but the most important being a hit or a break. Let me show you an example. So what shape would you say this is? It's a sphere, right? Well, <laughs> no, it's not. It has all these faceted edges that break up the form. This is the exact same idea when I start creating those hard plane changes on my shapes. I do that to first understand where and how the surface is turning, and then after I get it where I want, then I smooth it out. Now on a shape like this, it's very easy to do because it's all perfectly symmetrical, but on a more complex shape like a face, you have to take the time to plan out those foundational forms. Then you can smooth and blend them later on. Okay, let's do another question from I'm a Wonder. When you were younger, what did you want to be when you grew up? <laughs> I think the earliest thing I can remember wanting to be was legitimately a comedian. Uh, this was when I was very young though, and I really just kind of enjoyed making people laugh. But as a more serious answer, as far back as I can remember, I have always been playing video games. I used to sit on my dad's lap because I couldn't reach the keyboard and mouse, and we would play Wolfenstein, which maybe not the best game for a little kid in hindsight, and a really cool game called Descent, which maybe a few of you have played as well. And ever since then, I've been really into computers, really into video games, and I think all that hugely influenced where I am today. I played a ton of games growing up, and I was always drawn to the idea of working on them. I initially went to college with the intention of being a programmer, but it ended up not being my thing. That's when I fell more into the artistic side of things. Today, I don't work on a ton of games, really. I have, most recently, I did some stuff for Supercell, the creators of Clash of Clans, but most of the work I do now is for physical production. So toys, stuff for 3D printing, rapid prototyping, life-size figures for museums, amusement parks, all sorts of fun stuff, as well as working with my students. I love education, I'm all about it, and I have some courses online, namely the Appeal Academy, but we don't need to turn this into an ad, so if you are interested, there is of course a link down in the description with some more info there for you. Let's talk more about this stage of the process, which is getting in some rough shapes for the clothing. In the concept, the clothing feels too thick or wide, almost like it's a jacket, but I don't think it's supposed to be. I've looked up some references for this type of school or sailor uniform, and they involve much thinner fabric. I don't know why they actually wear sailor uniforms. I looked it up and it said because they're cheap, but that can't be the only reason. Uh, essentially, I don't want her shoulders to get too large here in 3D either because 
she might end up feeling too masculine proportionally. So it's going to be a balance with staying close to the concept, but not letting her drift too far into wide shoulder territory. I have a lot of fun modeling clothes. There is a ton of room for variation, and this outfit is definitely unique. You'll see me working on the area around the neck, including the red scarf tied together at the bottom. Collars are always a little time consuming to make, a little bit tricky. I poly modeled this one with the Z modeler brush for those that are familiar. And then the scarf was a couple pieces of geometry that I threw together real fast. Nothing very complicated, but all the same, everything needs to get done here. Then it's off to the arms, or in this instance, the sleeves. No reason to really put some arms in there if they're never gonna be seen. Uh, so gotta shape those up. Really sharp angle bends like what we have here in the elbow are easier for me to make if I just cut up a couple tubes of geometry, angle them properly, then weld them back together. So that is exactly what I do here to get those arms roughly where they need to be. There is a lot off about this area, but you have to get the rough shapes in first before you can start refining. Then finally, I add in the cuffs down here and general placement for the hands, which I will return to and speak more on later. <laughs> so this face is pretty rough right now. Don't worry though, it just needs a little love. So I spend some time getting in the eyelids as well as making a few other changes. You'll notice what I've done here is projected the concept image onto the skull to help align some facial features. I erase all of that later on, of course. This image that I'm working from is very painterly, and I will obviously need to do some work to pull that into the final render. So a lot of those hand-painted shadows I'll have to get with the physical lights I set up later on. Next, I do some quick rough paint on the eyes and add in the most basic shape of the eyelashes. Then I add in more of the individual shapes for each lash and continue to rework the proportions of the face. Then I spend a little bit more time in that area, just a bunch of little tweaks over about 20 minutes to get things feeling closer to our image. I like to think of refining your sculpture as a lot of tiny changes that add up into larger changes. That is why I often recommend take screenshots of your work as you progress, so that after a little while, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, an hour, whatever it may be, you can take a step back to look at where you were and where you are now. It's very important to be able to see that progress kind of play out as you go. I wanted to talk about the colors of this character. If you haven't noticed, I've kept a lot of the rough paint on the face, and that is because the distant read is still pretty good on that. At this stage, I am debating whether or not to keep the super colorful and saturated areas of the skin. Typically, I won't hand paint shadows or highlights because they can be overdone really easily and then it clashes with your render once you actually get lights in there. In the case with this character, my fear is that it won't feel close enough if I don't get a lot of those colors in. There are a lot of blues and pinks going on with the skin, and I want some of that in the final character. I'll be experimenting from here with toning some of that down to get it to a more neutral skin tone, and later I can get some of it back in with lighting. Speaking of colors, I'm a Wonder's next question is, what is your favorite color palette to work with? And honestly, this is a pretty tough question for me to answer. I am typically a lot more concerned with form over color. And when I first read this question, there wasn't really anything that came to mind. So I went to my art station and looked at a lot of my work and noticed that majority of it tends to lean in the blue spectrum. But really, I love switching it up as often as possible. The character I did before this one, Enchantress, had a lot of greens and oranges. And before that with my Morrigan sculpt, lots of purples. So yeah, lots of variation. I love the palette with this character, with all the contrast. And I think the render here is gonna be pretty awesome. We also have some little accessories here and there on the face. I quickly drop some simple stuff there to just gauge where it all needs to be. I plan on modeling all of this later, but it's good to get a general sense at first. This includes the jewelry for the earrings as well as the collar. I modeled that using the Z modeler brush, which lets you have specific control over each individual polygon. The heart shape for the collar was actually a little tough to get right. I ended up using a Boolean to remove the middle section. And then to get that specific roundness, I cleaned it up by reducing the polygon count with Z remesher. And then I went in and had to kind of hand tweak some of the polygons, but very boring stuff to watch. So we won't be looking at it too much here. In general, I would say the less polygons you have, the easier it is to control the shape. Not always the case, but here it definitely was. On to the next steps with the hair. This involves me cleaning up the bangs by first splitting them up into strips of geometry. Then I use what is called the topology brush to draw out the geometry on the form by hand. This lets me create very low poly geometry that I can manipulate to be a lot more clean than what I had before. 
I prefer starting off this way so that I can have more control over individual parts. Later on, I will combine this all back together so that I can blend more specific areas. It might feel a little counterproductive to jump back and forth from rough Dynamesh geometry to clean topology and then back to Dynamesh, but I don't think so. I really do whatever it takes to have as much control as possible. There are a million other ways I could have done this with the bangs, but this is the way I did it this time around. Now I'm working on the sleeves to start sculpting some of the folds. They are way too boring right now and need some more shape. I think sculpting folds is always fun. A lot of people probably don't like it, but I do. <laughs> I think it's a great way to practice the fundamental of what I like to call the flow of form. It sounds really fancy, but I promise it's not. It's a little more of an advanced topic, but to simplify, it's the idea of following a shape from the silhouette. So for instance, if I see a fold on the side of the arm from the front view, you know that is not all there is to that shape. I know that that form is wrapping around the arm. Figuring out where that shape is going is figuring out the flow of your form. There are a bunch of different types of folds, but for the most part, you can section them off into compression and tension. There is a lot of variation there. Like for instance, we have what's called a half lock fold in the crease of the elbow and some spiral folds around the arm. And if you understand how fabric tends to fold, then you can infer a lot of information from even a single view like what we have here. And then some simple poly modeling for the cuffs around the wrist, which doesn't take very long at all. And then it's off to the face to do a couple quick changes before jumping over to model some of the stickers that will be up here as well. I assume the yellow ones are stickers at least. Obviously the white one is more of a bandage. Uh, I'll flatten these later and match them to the shape of the face. But for now, it's just easier to make them dimensional. Time to work on some beautiful pink hair. Much like with everything else, I start by blocking out the large shapes, carving into my surface to get an idea of how I want to split this up. I make a lot of changes to proportions and for the most part, stay messy with my sculpture at this stage. It's really easy to be hesitant to move forward because you're attached to what you have, but most of the time it's just kind of better to plunge full speed ahead and make those changes, whether they are messy or not. <laughs> and honestly, keeping things a little messy feels like it gives yourself permission to kind of plunge right ahead and continue forward quickly because you want to improve that. You want to clean it up. So maybe try staying off a, a little bit more messy in the beginning stages. Hair is honestly just such a complicated puzzle but the pieces aren't squared off with different sized holes punched out of them. They're complicated, crazy shapes, and you have to figure out how they all connect. It's a little bit like water in a way, and requires the same fundamental that I spoke on earlier with the folds in the sleeves. I don't typically enjoy doing traditional stick the pieces together, form a picture type puzzles all that much, but I think hair can be a lot of fun. It's definitely something that requires a large time investment because we aren't actually making hair, right? we are creating something that looks like hair or gives the impression of hair. And that, for better or worse, requires a lot of work. You'll see me repeat this process of starting rough and then knocking back some of the hard shapes quite often. This is how I try to push or exaggerate my sculpts. And it's something that can create some cool, large forms in the hair that you may not discover without really trying to push that shape to the breaking point. I do this for the bangs as well as our crispy pink cinnamon buns on top of the head. Man, some cinnamon buns sound really good right now, don't they? I'm gonna have to take a break and go grab some. Maybe while I do that, I can answer another question here, which is what kind of music or podcasts are you currently listening to? And honestly, I love this question because I will talk about podcasts any chance I can get. Anymore, I tend to listen to podcasts a lot more than music. I don't typically do that while I'm sculpting because it makes it kind of hard to focus. Uh, but if I'm doing something a little mindless, I will listen to one while I work. I love My Brother, My Brother and Me and The Adventure Zone, of course. Some others I really enjoy are Hey Riddle Riddle and Hello from the Magic Tavern, just to name a few. Other than that, I sometimes listen to just some chill music without any lyrics so that I can still focus a little while I sculpt. You know, your chill hip hop beats to study to, even though I'm not technically studying. <laughs> I listen to a bunch of other music, of course, but those are the mainstays. I've made some more minor tweaks to the proportions to hopefully make the character not feel too wide in 3D. I'm hoping it doesn't stray too far from the concept there, but I like the changes. Then it is off to posing, which for this character isn't too drastic. I've talked a lot about posing in the past, and because this pose is more simple, I could start the character symmetrically. And now at this stage, I can start breaking symmetry even more. I've kind of already done that with a lot of the parts that were completely asymmetrical, and that was to save on time. So this character was a blend between starting symmetrically with places like the face and asymmetrically with areas like the arms. 
I have another question that I really wanted to answer, completely unrelated to this process, but I would love to hear what everyone else's response would be down in the comments. If you could live in any fictional universe, which one would it be and why? This is such a cool question and I could think of so many, but right now I've been reading a lot of the Tower of God webcomic. I'm almost on chapter 300 or so, and it is such a cool universe. I love it and it would be so cool to live in that universe for a day. Wait, did she say for a... Oh no, okay. So I guess you'd be like trapped in this universe? Oh gosh, I might have to change my answer now. <laughs> Wait, no, no, I'll, I'll keep it, I'll keep it. But let me know maybe down in the comments what universe you would like to be trapped in forever. <laughs> okay, after getting the initial pose down, there are a lot of little things that require some tweaking. This involves realigning a lot of overlapping parts that start to interpenetrate each other. When you have geometry that has different levels of resolution layered on top of each other, it will naturally get misaligned when posing or making any other kind of big change. Another problem that could arise is, for example, if I had these arms in a neutral pose, like a T pose, well, I would have to redo a ton of work there to start correcting them after bending them into position. That is why I started with them in the pose they are in now. So if you remember from before, I was talking about how sometimes it's easier to start asymmetrically with certain areas. That is a great example of one of those. Throughout working on a character, I will jump around and make changes to anything that stands out. This is to keep myself from getting tunnel vision so that I can stay focused on the big picture, literally. I pull the cheekbones forward here to help keep the eyes from feeling like they would fall out of her head, and then I went about converting the stickers on the face into flat geometry. I do this with geometry because I can only get so much resolution out of polypaint, and this method is pretty simple to do for something that will only be rendered. Plus, because this is a separate piece of geometry, it's really simple for me to set this up as a separate or different material. All right, I have not been super good at going through all of these great questions in a timely manner, so let's do one more here. Ooh, and this is actually a pretty tough one. What is one piece of advice you would give to your past self? My way younger self, I would have always been trying to get me interested in art, I think. I didn't pick up art until I was in my young 20s, so I have had to cram a lot in a very short amount of time to get to where I am now. And I really do wish that I did a lot more art when I was younger. If I was giving like an actual piece of advice, hmm. Yeah, that's a tough question. I think there is really a lot that you could say, but for the most part, I don't think people really need advice. I always say that at the end of the day, people will do exactly what they want. If you wanna practice some skill, whether that be artistic or otherwise, you're gonna do that. If you wanna chill and watch a movie, well then you'll do that. I guess what I'm saying is you need to enjoy or learn to enjoy the process, the hard parts, the practice. That's kind of what passion is in a way. That's not really much of advice, but if you are doing something that you don't want to do, well, ask yourself why you're doing it. And if it is to get to an end goal that requires some really hard stuff along the way, if you can learn to love that process, the rest will be downhill from there. I don't know if that was actual advice or me just rambling, but um, yeah, that's what I got. One thing you're gonna see coming up is that I add in a blue circle behind the character. I did this because it is in the final illustration and it's helping me to gauge some proportions here on the character. I noticed that I overdid the lean forward on the character so I lessened that here too. And then it's back to another pass on the face to do some more small tweaks like making the eyes smaller, changing their angle, as well as adding in fake highlights to get a better idea of how they will look for the final render. Moving on with another fun question, what is your number one travel destination? I really enjoyed living in Tokyo for a little. Visiting Italy was fun as well. Uh, other than that, I'm not super world travel, but pretty much anywhere warm is very okay with me. I don't know if I could pick just one place. I am just going to pick New Zealand. I think there's a lot of variety and environment there. I've never been. I don't think I've ever seen an ugly photo of New Zealand. So shout out to any New Zealanders watching. I would love to come visit. So while talking about cool travel destinations, I noticed that there were some changes that needed to happen with the hair. Some parts were not really lining up with the reference image and needed to be corrected. The bangs were way too wide and need to taper a lot faster towards the top and I was completely missing the little upturned piece on the right side of her hair. So I added all that in real quick to match the silhouette a bit more closely. Then I started to greatly soften the form of her hair. I had over sculpted a lot of this and it was way stronger than an I'm a Wonders image. The hair is a big part of this character 
and I don't want it to have a lot of super strong shadows cast from these huge forms in the final render, especially if it's not present in the reference or if it doesn't improve the final image. Which I can't say that they do, so it's bye-bye to some of that form, and I'm not getting rid of all of it, I'm more so changing it and making it a little less exaggerated. While finishing up some little things on the hair, let's try one more cue. Out of these three superpowers, uh, teleportation, invisibility, or telekinesis, which one would you want and why? <laughs> I don't think it's a contest, at least for me. Obviously, telekinesis. I feel like this one is so cool. Being able to move stuff with your mind is the ultimate lazy person's dream. And knowing me, if I could teleport, I feel like I would accidentally end up in space somehow. <laughs> So let's go with the easy one that I'm least likely to hurt myself with. Plus Mob Psycho 100, right? I had roughly thrown a few pieces of geometry down on the fingers for some nails. You can see me beginning to actually shape those up into some semblance of fingernails, as well as shaping the fingers to make room for those, which will require a bit of time. Whenever working on two areas that interact with one another, like fingernails or teeth in gums or anywhere else that things are touching or interacting with each other, you have to make that interaction feel believable, or else they end up feeling stuck on and unfinished. Speaking of unfinished, I have yet to give this girl her glove. A little bit of a crime at this point, kind of forgot about it. If you're familiar with extracting geometry for clothing, that is essentially what I do here, but I rarely ever use the default extraction tool set. I prefer to manually extract my geometry. Here, I just slice off parts of the fingers and wrist and then inflate the hand to start creating the glove. Then the few other parts of that are poly modeled and well, just like that, you pretty much have a glove. Pretty simple to do, as long as you have a good base to build on top of. This is one of the final little tweaks I do to the hair to sharpen it up and give it a little bit more dimension. It was really just looking too flat. So I decided to go back in there and pinch some of the form to get it feeling more dimensional. I really enjoyed this look and it ends up looking a lot better in the final render for it. Other than that, that is pretty much it for the modeling on this character, which means it's time to pack everything up and ship it off to the render farm, aka Blender. So I import everything as an OBJ that I have either applied auto UVs to or some vertex color and begin setting up my scene. So while rendering this character, I experimented with the lighting quite a lot. I wanted to try getting a similar effect to I'm a Wonder's painting with the pink highlights, but I found that any pink lights I added blew out all the other colors in the image, and I wasn't a huge fan of that. So I played around with a couple different render passes and then composited everything together in Photoshop. Particularly here, that meant making one render with nice neutral lighting, and then doing another render with a really strong pink light. Taking that and only applying it to specific areas like the jacket, this effect was a little overblown at first, so I had to decrease it quite a lot to get it to a good place. And here is the final render of all of that hard work. I know a lot of people end up skipping here to the end for the final render, so hey you dirty skippers, what's going on? <laughs> but in all seriousness, I do not mind if you skip the video. I appreciate you checking out my work all the same. If you do enjoy my work though, I know you'll enjoy hearing a little bit more about the process, so do consider going back and checking it out. And if you have somehow made it this far without checking out the first part of this process, do go give I'm a Wonders video a look at the link in the description. Thank you everyone for watching and a massive thank you to Tina over on the I'm a Wonder YouTube channel for agreeing to do this collaboration. I hope you like the character, Tina. I had a ton of fun working on this collab and I can't wait to see what you end up making next. If you are new around here, click that subscribe button. And if you want to learn more about digital sculpting, check out gumroad.com slash Folygon for my custom brushes, materials, and courses. You can find all of that at the link in the description, including my course slash mentorship program, The Appeal Academy, where I work with each individual student to go through the process of creating a character from beginning to end. Kind of like what we did here in this video. And that's all for this one, everybody. Again, thank you for watching. You have a great rest of your day, and I'll see you in the next one.